A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankara A's Academy for the date 18th of December 2021. We have a diverse list of articles that we have taken today for a discussion. I will give you a brief about them. The first article here, it is about the data given by National Statistical Office. That is nothing but NSO. Under this article, we are going to see what are all the constraints that India have for achieving the growth rate of 9.5 percentage. The second article, it is about India-China relationship. Under this article discussion, we are going to see the historical, economical and political perspective of India-China relationship and we will see the possibility of Russia being a mediator between India and China. The third article, it is an environmental article. Under this discussion, we will see the diversion of forest land for non-forest purposes and we will see the pros and cons of forest diversion. And finally, the fourth article, it is about the federal structure. Under this article discussion, we are going to discuss about the features of federal system of government. So, without any delay, let us get into the article discussion. Look at this editorial. This editorial is written by Mr. C. Rangarajan, who was the former governor of RBI. It is about the recently released data by National Statistical Office. See, the NSO on November 2021 released GVA, that is gross value added, and GDP data, that is gross domestic product data, for the second quarter of the financial year 2021-22. Second quarter is nothing but from the month June to September. So, this is the general introduction about the editorial. The syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. Before starting the discussion, I have given here the definitions of various economic terms that are used in this editorial. I request the aspirants to go through it so that you will understand the discussion better. I will also explain them wherever it is needed. See the general idea behind taking this editorial is it consists of data from national statistical office so the data that is provided in this editorial will help you in enriching your main answer so go through these definitions the first one is gdp gva base effect gross fixed capital formation final consumption expenditure gross tax revenue tax buoyancy purchasing managers index fiscal deficit. So, these are the definitions. I will also explain them wherever it is needed. You also go through them once before. Now, let us start the discussion. See, due to the COVID induced lockdown, the economy contracted in the first quarter of the financial year 2020-21. Due to this contraction and the associated base effect, the first quarter experienced a real GDP and GVA growth rates of 20.1 percentage and 18.8 percentage respectively. See here the base effect is nothing but the effect that occurs whenever two data points are compared as a ratio. So, in this ratio the current data point is divided or expressed as a percentage of another data point which is nothing but the base or the point of comparison. The base effect can lead to an apparent understatement or overstatement of figures such as inflation rates or economic growth rates if the point chosen for comparison has an unusually high or low value. India's GDP for the first quarter of 2021-22 grew at 20.1 percentage compared to a contraction of 24. 4 percentage in the same period a year ago that is 2020-21. So, this is the base effect here. So, while comparing 2020-21 and 21-22, the GDP growth rate is 20.1 percentage. But the base effect reduced in the subsequent quarter. Due to the weakened base effect, the GDP and the GVA growth in the second quarter was only 8.4 percentage and 8.5 percentage respectively. So, to remove the distortion caused by the base effect, it is only fair to compare the GDP and GVA data to the pre-COVID days that is financial year 
2019-20 see now you understand how the base effect has created an illusion of growth here in the first quarter of 2021-22 since the gdp was 24.4 percentage in 2020 and 2021 the base effect has caused the figure to stand at 20.1 percentage irrespective of the contraction so only when we compare the first quarter of financial year 2019-20 and the financial year 21-22 we can see the fact that the economy has actually contracted compared to the first quarter of the financial year 2019-20 the gva for the current financial year has contracted by 3.7 percentage and the gdp has contracted by 4.4 percentage as the base effect will further weaken in the third and fourth quarter to achieve a higher growth compared to the financial year 2019-20 a strong growth momentum is needed in the third and fourth quarters according to the author And according to the editorial in the first half of the financial year 2021-22 only the following sectors that is agriculture electricity gas mining and quarrying public administration and defense services has actually grown compared to the pre covid levels that is financial year 2019-20 mainly public administration has grown by 5.8 percentage and defense services grew by 17.4 percentage according to the editorial this growth is mainly due to central government capital expenditure which grew by 38.3 percentage during the first half of 2021-22 so according to this article the growth in these sectors is due to the increase in central governments capital expenditure now coming to the demand side that is the consumption expenditure see the private final consumption expenditure that is nothing but the expenditure incurred on final consumption of goods and services by the resident households or non profit institutions so it is nothing but the residents spending on goods and services so according to this article this pfce in the first half of 2021-22 has contracted when compared to the level in 2019-20 to experience a strong growth momentum in the third and fourth quarters the consumption must pick up according to the editorial the private consumption demand would pick up with employment and income growth so it is obvious right when people have money in their hands and they have job to do then only they'll spend on goods and services this can happen only when the small and medium sectors fully recover the recovery is happening and will continue to happen in the second half of the financial year 2021-22 provided that the new covid variant does not cause any disruption here omicron is the new covid variant that we are talking about see the rbi and the imf IMF is nothing but International Monetary Fund. They have forecasted India's growth rate for 2021-22 to be 9.5 percentage. To achieve this growth rate, India has to grow at a pace of 6.2 percentage in the second half of the current financial year. This is not an easy task given the base effect. Hence, achieving the projected growth rate is going to be a big challenge for India. Now let us see some of the measures suggested by the author to achieve the 9.5 percentage growth rate. Firstly, the government must increase its capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is nothing but the expenses that are incurred by an organization to improve its assets. That is nothing but equipments, machinery, buildings, etc. So the first measure is government should increase its capital expenditure see in the first half of the current financial year the government's gross tax revenue grew by 64.2 percentage and also presently the tax buoyancy is at 2.7 percentage let's go back and see what is tax buoyancy tax buoyancy it is nothing but the relationship between the changes in the government's tax revenue growth and the changes in the gdp that is the responsiveness of the tax revenue growth to the changes in gdp 
so when a tax is buoyant it means the revenue increases without increasing the tax rate so now according to the article the tax buoyancy is at 2.7 so what can be done the government can leverage this aspect and profit and provide a strong fiscal support in the form of government capital expenditure so the first point is nothing but government is having tax revenue and it grew in the first half of the current financial year so what the suggestion is government should utilize this revenue for forming capital expenditure the second measure is the government must increase its infrastructure spending see recently the amount allocated for food and fertilizer subsidies mnrega has been increased in addition to that pradhan mantri garib kalyan anna yojana has also been extended so the editorial mentions that in spite of this spending the government must continue to increase its infrastructure spending thirdly the centers incentivization of state capital expenditure through additional borrowing limits would also help in this regard this is nothing but incentivizing states capital expenditure measures see the states are having particular borrowing limits so by increasing those limits the state can utilize more funds for capital expenditure which in turn will help in achieving the growth rate of 9.5 percentage see compared to the financial year 2019-20 the government is now placed in a better position i'll tell you why in the year 2019-20 only the first half experienced a growth in the gross tax revenue the second half actually experienced a contraction the first half experienced a growth rate of 1.5 percentage and the second half experienced a contraction of 3.4 percentage the financial year 2019 also experienced a reduced real gdp growth of just 4 percentage now compare this with the current financial year there are lot of positive signs in the current financial year the growth in the tax revenue in the first half was 64.2 percentage the purchasing managers index is at 10 month high which is 57.6 we'll see what is purchasing managers index it is nothing but a survey based measure that asks the respondents about key business variables see the main purpose of this index is to provide information about the current and the future business conditions to the decision makers and the investors see they are conducting a survey here and based on the outcome of the survey the company's decision makers or the investors plan the business it is calculated separately for manufacturing and service sectors so this is what is purchasing managers index so that is also high now and the gross gst collection has been consistently above the benchmark limit of 1 lakh crore rupees and note that iip which is nothing but index of industrial production which consists of core industries it is also growing compared to the 2019 level and the growth was recorded at 7% and even the merchandise exports grew by 35.9 percentage in 2021 compared to the 2019 level so all in all the government is better placed so unlike in the financial year 2019-20 when the government could not give a proper fiscal stimulus now it can increase its spending so the key to attaining a 9.5 percentage real gdp annual growth in 2021-22 lies in the government's ongoing emphasis on infrastructure spending as reflected in government's capital expenditure this is nothing but if the government has to achieve a growth rate of 9.5 percentage then it has to increase its infrastructure spending and it should increase its spending in capital expenditure and not just that the government must take steps to sustain this momentum for the rest of the fiscal year So with this we have come to the end of our discussion. Let's have a quick recap. We saw the data from National Statistical Office. We saw how the economy contracted and how the base effect played a major role in that. 
and we saw what are all the sectors that has improved which includes agriculture electricity gas mining and quarrying public administration and defense services and we also saw that the consumption expenditure is very low and we moved on to see the forecast of india's growth rate which is nothing but 9.5 percentage and we saw what are all the constraints in achieving those and we saw some of the measures that will help india in achieving the growth rate of 9.5 percentage so what are they increasing capital expenditure increasing infrastructure spending incentivizing state capital expenditure and increasing the borrowing limits for the states and finally we saw some data which shows that india is better placed now and it should sustain this momentum to achieve the growth rate of 9.5 percentage with these points in mind let's move on to the next article see this news article here it is an editorial article this article is with respect to the bilateral relations between india china india russia and russia and china this article also gives some insights about russia being a facilitator between india and china so in this context we are going to analyze indo china relationship and the constraints or in other words the challenges in their relationship and at the end of the discussion we'll also briefly discuss why russia as a mediator should be thought twice the syllabus relevant for the analysis is given here for your reference please go through it okay first of all we'll see about indo china relationship see historically the written records of contacts between india and china date back to at least 2nd century bc but the commerce between the two countries it got a boost with the advent of buddhism into china from india in the 1st century ad so this is because monks from the two countries they traveled to the other country and visited the place and they wrote books which helped the countries to know about one another for example a chinese monk fazian visited india in 402 ad and stayed in india for 10 years and after his return to china he translated many sanskrit buddhist texts into chinese so by this way chinese people got to know more about india zhuang sang visited india during harshavardhana's reign in the 7th century ad in search of buddhist scriptures and wrote a book called a journey to the west and yoga is now becoming increasingly popular in china China is also one of the co-sponsors to the UN resolution designating June 21 as the International Day of Yoga. So this shows the cultural significance of both the countries. Now economically there is a rapid expansion of India China bilateral trade. China emerged as one of the largest goods trading partner for India in the year 2008. and even now china continues to hold that position in 2017 and 18 the bilateral trade has registered robust two digit growth in 2020 india became the 16th largest trade partner of china the total bilateral trade witnessed a reduction of 5.64 percentage year on year to reach 87.65 billion dollars due to covid-19 implications see the flourishing trade has brought with it advantages such as availability of low priced items in india but at the same time it has also led to the biggest single trade deficit we are running with any country during the first half of 2021 the trade deficit rose by 56.12 percentage that is 28.10 billion dollars in parallel with the increase of bilateral trade during the same period refer the table here just remember that india has a huge trade deficit with china you don't have to remember the data given in this table and now let's move on to see the political perspective 
On April 1, 1950, India became the first non-socialist bloc country to establish diplomatic relations with People's Republic of China. Prime Minister Nehru visited India in October 1954 and established ties with China. Though the border conflict that had happened in 1962 was a setback to the ties, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi visited China in the year 1988. and this visit marked the beginning of improvement in bilateral trades in the year 1993 the agreement on the maintenance of peace and tranquility along the line of actual control on the india china border was signed but the bilateral relations between china and india have been impacted by the situation in the border areas along the lac that is nothing but line of actual control this is in the ladakh region See LAC is nothing but the demarcation that separates Indian controlled territory from the Chinese controlled territory. LAC is not fully agreed by both the countries. Here in this map LAC is given and politically an informal summit has been held between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping in Chennai on October 2019. In that summit it was decided to establish high level mechanism on economic and trade dialogue and this was done to strengthen the bilateral trade and investment cooperation and better promote the balanced development of bilateral economic and trade cooperation see this dialogue is important because india is having a trade deficit with china but based on this dialogue it is said that it will promote the balanced development of bilateral economic trade but however there has been no progress on this front due to covid-19 outbreak and one more reason is that the border tensions in the galwan valley see both india and china have been involved in a military tussle in galwan valley which is situated along the line of actual control so no dialogues under the existing institutional mechanisms have taken place between the years 2020 and 21 so this is the skeleton of india china relations so far now coming back to the editorial so we all know that india russia defense and bilateral ties have considerably strengthened we have signed treaty of friendship with russia and the government went on with the purchase deal of s400 missile defense systems despite the us threat of sanctions and also note that russia is the largest arms supplier to india on the other hand russia also have consolidated their support for china in many cases they have consolidated their support in the face of us concerns and china's action on taiwan and in turn china also ex- extended its support to russia over its action against ukraine this is nothing but the seizure of crimea by russia from ukraine in the year 2014 and also note that russia is also deeply dependent on chinese investment particularly in the 400 billion dollar gas pipeline infrastructure so under this project russia will deliver 1 trillion cubic meters of natural gas to china over the next 30 years analyzing the above factors we can conclude that russia is in close ties with both india and china so in this context india should think twice before involving in any trilateral relations that is ric which is nothing but russia india and china so with this we have come to the end of this discussion let's have a quick recap so what all we saw the cultural significance of both the countries and the bilateral trade between the two countries and we saw some facts relating to that and we are having trade deficit with china and we also covered the political perspective of india china relationship and finally we saw why india should think twice before involving in any trilateral relations that includes india russia and china so with these takeaway points let's move on to the next article See this article here it deals with the diversion of forest land for non forestry purposes the article gives us data regarding diversion of forest land to non forest purposes in the past 5 years by various states 
I have given the data that are mentioned in the article in the table form here for your reference. See, first of all, you should understand that the forest lands are diverted using the Forest Conservation Act of 1980. The article also mentions that 206 proposals involving around 4,118.1 hectare area for the conversion into non-forest use during 2020 and 21. And this 4,000 hectare area is within the protected areas which includes national parks and sanctuaries which has been recommended by the Standing Committee of National Board for Wildlife for the conversion. So, in this context, let us see some points regarding the conversion of forest lands for the non-forest use. So, first of all, let us see what are the cons of diverting forest land. The first one is that it destroys the complex food web. We all know that forests have a complex food web and this will be destroyed if forest is converted. Compensatory afforestation cannot exactly regenerate the complicated food chain associated with the natural forest. The second and the most important con is loss of habitat. See, the forests are associated with biodiversity. So, many plants and animals will lose their natural habitat if forests are being converted. Forests are nature's lungs. They will help sequester carbon. Carbon sequestration is nothing but capturing carbon from atmosphere. So, once these forests are diverted, carbon gets released into the atmosphere leading to global warming. See, one of the main consequences of converting forest to non-forest land is land degradation. Land degradation happens due to soil erosion. Once the forest trees are removed, the topsoil becomes loose and it is easily eroded. And the next point is tribal communities who depend on forest are extremely affected by this act. They lose their identity, their livelihood and it will create a traumatic effect. And the next point is forests actually act as sponges and help retain water. Forests mainly in the watershed area help in diverting water to the river which in turn are a lifeline for an agricultural country like India. If the forest is destroyed, the water in the rivers are also affected. And finally, forests are the storehouses of natural pollinators. The pollinators help in increasing agricultural productivity in areas around forests. Once forests is destroyed, the pollinators lose their home. This in turn affects the agricultural productivity. So far, we saw the cons. Along with the cons, there are also some pros regarding conversion of forest into non-forest land. We will see what are the pros regarding the conversion. The first one is to support India's growing population, agricultural production must be increased. One way of increasing agricultural production is by increasing the size of available arable land by clearing forest. Arable land is nothing but land which is capable of being ploughed and they are used to grow crops. The second point is in India many forest areas are rich in natural resources. Mining these resources will help increase India's GDP and also provide employment opportunities to the people. This will help attain demographic dividend. The next point is, in some of the cases, converting forest areas into non-forest use can be advantageous in the long run. Laying highways will bring down the travel time and the carbon dioxide emission, which in turn reduces global warming. The next point is, by laying railway lines or metro projects, people will be incentivized to use public transport. This also helps reduce the number of private vehicles on the road, thus reducing carbon dioxide emissions. See, we cannot completely ignore the resources of the forest and we cannot go on exploiting forests like there is no tomorrow. We must take a balanced approach. We must take steps to sustainably use forest resources to uphold intergenerational equity. Here in this news article, it mentions about the capital accounting 
and valuation of ecosystem services. We'll understand what it is. We have to calculate the monetary value of the ecosystem services provided by the forest. When there is a proposal to convert the forest land for non-forest uses, first of all, we should see the monetary value of the ecosystem services and we should also see the monetary value associated with the conversion. And after doing that, we have to compare it. If the monetary value associated with the conversion is higher than the monetary value of the ecosystem services, then we must proceed with the conversion. If it is not higher than the monetary value of the forest ecosystem services, then we must stop the conversion. This will help us balance development and the ecosystem. So with this we have come to the end of our discussion. Let's have a quick recap. What all we saw? We saw that the forest lands can be diverted for non-forest uses under the Act, Forest Conservation Act of 1980 and we saw some of the cons of diverting the forest land and after that we saw some of the pros regarding the conversion of forest land and finally we saw about capital accounting and valuation of ecosystem services. So with this key takeaway points let's move on to the next article. See yesterday that is on 17th December 2021 one of the national parties BJP announced an alliance with the Punjab Lok Congress. So the article is about this alliance. We are not going to discuss the article here. So in this context, let us understand some of the important points regarding the features of the federal structure. First of all, let us have an understanding on the basis of nature of relations between the national government and the regional governments. See the government, it can be classified into unitary and federal systems. We will see what they are. By definition, a unitary government is one in which all the powers are vested in the national government and the regional governments, if at all they exist, they derive their authority from the national government. So this is how a unitary system of government works. Let us see some examples for this system of governments. The examples are Britain, France, Japan, China, Italy, Belgium, and Norway. Now let's see what a federal government is. A federal government on the other hand is one in which the powers are divided between the national government and the regional governments by a mechanism. In most of the cases it is the constitution. So these governments which are the national government and the regional governments they both operate in their respective jurisdictions independently. We'll see some examples. US, Switzerland, Australia, Canada, Russia, Brazil and Argentina. So we saw two types of government based on the nature of relations between the national government and the regional government. What are those two types? They are unitary system of government and federal system of government. In this discussion we are going to concentrate on the federal system of government. So let us understand how a federation is formed. A federation it can be formed in two ways that is by the way of integration or by the way of disintegration. In the first case, a number of militarily weak or economically backward states or just independent states, they come together to form a big and strong union. For example, the United States of America. We all know that independent states, they came together and they formed a union that is the United States of America. This is one way of federation formation. In the second case, a big unitary state is converted into a federation by granting autonomy to the provinces to promote regional interest. Here the example is Canada. So from this we know that a federation can be formed in two ways. One is by the way of integration. For that we saw United States of America as an example and by the way of disintegration. For this we saw the example of Canada. So here the question arises, what about India? See in India, the constitution of India provides for a federal system of government in the country. However, the term federation has nowhere been used in the constitution. So note this point, 
Our constitution provides for a federal system, but the word federation is not used in the constitution. It is very important to remember this fact. Instead, Article 1 of the constitution describes India as a union of states. According to Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the phrase union of states has been preferred to indicate two things. One is, Indian Federation is not a result of an agreement among states like the American Federation. So, we saw American Federation is formed by the way of integration. Independent states, they came together and formed a union. So, Indian Federation is not formed by that way. And the second point is that the states have no right to secede from the federation. Secede is nothing but becoming independent. So, for these two reasons, the phrase union of states is used in Indian constitution under article 1. So, to put it in simple words, the Indian federation resembles the Canadian federation in three ways. So, the first point is, it resembles the Canadian Federation in its formation. How Canadian Federation is formed? By the way of disintegration. So, the Indian Union, it is disintegrated into several states to promote regional interest. The second resemblance is in its preference to the term Union. The Canadian Federation is also called a Union. And the third resemblance is in its centralizing tendency. That is nothing but vesting more powers in the center. That is exactly why Indian Federation is also called as federal structure with the unitary bias. Okay, since we have discussed some of the important points, let's move on to see the unique features of federal structure. What are all the features that should be there if a system should be called as a federal system of government? The first point is dual polity. It should consist a union at the center and state at its periphery. And each should be endowed with sovereign powers to be exercised in the field assigned to them by a constitution. The second point is having written constitution. So, the written constitution, it only specifies the structure, organization, powers and functions of both the central and state governments and it prescribes the limit within which they must operate. Thus, it avoids misunderstandings and disagreements between the two. The third feature is separation of powers, which is also called as division of power. See, if you take India, the constitution divides the powers between center and the states in terms of union list, state list and concurrent list in the seventh schedule. Both the center and states can make laws on the subjects of concurrent list, but in the case of conflict, the central law prevails. The center has exclusive powers to make laws on the subjects of union list and the states have exclusive powers to make laws on the subjects of state list. But the residuary subjects, that is the subjects which are not mentioned in any of these three lists, they are given to the center. So, this is exactly why Indian Federation is called as the federal structure with a unitary bias. Moving on, the next feature is supremacy of the constitution. The constitution, it should be the supreme or the highest law of the land. The laws enacted by the center and the states must conform to its provisions. Otherwise, they can be declared invalid by the courts through their power of judicial review. Thus, the organs of the government that are nothing but legislative, executive and judicial organs, they must operate within the jurisdiction prescribed by the constitution. The next feature is having a rigid constitution. See, having a rigid constitution is very important because the division of powers that are established by the constitution as well as the supremacy of the constitution, it can be maintained only if the method of its amendment is rigid. Because it is obvious, right? If the constitution can be amended with a simple procedure, it will undermine the ideology based on which it is written. Hence, the constitution should be rigid to the extent that those provisions which are concerned with the federal structure, that is nothing but which involves the state and center relations, 
it should be amended only by the joint action of central and state governments in india such provisions require a special majority of the parliament and also an approval of half of the state legislatures for the amendment and the next feature is having an independent judiciary so the courts at the center and state level should deal cases regarding the provisions related to its jurisdiction so with this we have come to the end of our discussion let's have a quick recap we saw different types of governments based on the relation between the national government and regional government they are nothing but unitary and federal system of governments and after that we saw a federation can be formed in two ways one is by the way of integration and the other one is by the way of disintegration and we saw examples for that and finally we saw some of the features of the federal system of government what are those features dual polity written constitution separation of powers supremacy of the constitution rigid constitution and independent judiciary so with this learned points in mind let's move on to the next part of our discussion we have finished discussing the articles today so now let's solve some practice prelims questions the first question here it is about compensatory afforestation fund act 2016 we'll solve it statement 1 the act was enacted to manage the funds collected for compensatory afforestation the second statement as per the rules 90% of the compensatory afforestation fund money is to be given to the center while 10% is to be retained by the states select the correct answer using the code given below one only two only both one and two neither one nor two see this first statement here it is correct because the main purpose for enacting this act is to manage the funds collected for compensatory afforestation see the compensatory afforestation means that every time forest land is diverted for non forest purposes such as mining or quarrying or for road construction the user agency pays for planting forest over an equal area of non forest land so this fund which is paid by the user agency is called as compensatory afforestation fund for maintaining this fund the act of compensatory afforestation fund act 2016 was enacted statement 2 as per the rules 90% of the money is to be given to the center is it right no because as per the rules 90% of the money is to be given to states while 10% is to be retained by the center so it is given in reverse order here so the statement 2 is incorrect so what is the correct answer here option a one only moving on the second question with reference to indian federation consider the following statements indian federation is a result of an agreement among states like the american federation statement 2 the federation is union because it is indestructible which of the following statements given above is or or incorrect see the question asked for incorrect statements so our purpose here is to find those incorrect statements we'll solve the question the first statement says that it is an agreement among states like american federation we saw in our discussion that american federation is formed by the way of integration independent states came together and formed a union but in case of indian federation it is not like that indian federation resembles canadian federation it is formed by the way of disintegration the union it is formed into separate states for regional development or for convenient administration so the statement one here is incorrect the second statement the federation is union because it is indestructible so this statement is correct because this indian federation it is called as union the states have no right to secede that is no right to become independent so it means it is indestructible indian union cannot be destroyed so the statement two here is correct so what is our purpose here it is to identify the incorrect statements which is the incorrect statement here it is statement 1 so the right answer here is option a 1 only 
Here I have given some of the mains questions for your practice. Interested candidates write it and post it in the comment section. So if you like the video, please like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.